Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Rosanna Francescato, Communications Director with the Clean Coalition, and we are really excited today to host this webinar on the Redwood Coast Airport Microgrid, or RECAM. RECAM is a unique project. It's staging to be the leading community microgrid showcase in California, and potentially anywhere. And it has the distinction of being the first front of meter multi-customer microgrid in Northern California. Now, before we get into more on ReCam, I wanna mention a few quick housekeeping items. Let's see. Uh-oh. Why can I, here we go. Um, first of all, we will email everyone the webinar recording and slides within a couple of business days. Also, all of our webinars are archived on our website, clean-coalition.org, under events. And if you have questions at any time during the webinar, please go ahead and type them in the question pane at the right of your screen. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A, which will follow the presentations. But you don't have to wait till then. You can type them in any time to be sure we get to your question. If you have questions about the Clean Coalition, you can contact me at rosanna at clean-coalition.org. And now moving on to today's presentation, we're lucky to have three great presenters with us who are part of the ReCAM project. Presenting today, we have Matthew Marshall, Executive Director of the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. Matthew also serves on the board of directors of several community nonprofits and is vice president of the California Community Choice Association. And he plays the bagpipes. And I think something that's important to call out during these times is that he's also assistant chief of the West Haven Volunteer Fire Department. So Matthew, thank you for that work. We also have with us today, Jim Zolik, principal engineer at the Schatz Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University. Jim has managed or co-managed two microgrid projects at the Blue Lake Rancheria, and he is co-managing the RECAM project. And finally, also presenting today is Carmen Henriksen, Vice President in TRC's Advanced Energy Practice. Carmen also serves on the Board of Directors for the California Efficiency and Demand Management Council. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Matthew to start the presentation and Carmen to run the slides. So let me just, um, Carmen the presenter here. And just a reminder, you can type your questions anytime in the question pane, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation. So Matthew and Carmen, take it away. Great, thanks, thanks for the introductions. And um, you know, I'm gonna kick off the presentation and then hand it to Jim and Carmen uh, to, to dive into more of the, the detailed uh, elements of the project. So just to kind of, you know, the, the, the sort of setting the stage for, for what we're looking to do, um, you know, this project is really sort of focused on, um, you know, elements of, you know, the, the, the overall transition to, to modernize the grid and particularly support the, the integration of, you know, more distributed energy resources um, and, you know, and, and a more resilient grid, um, you know, and really working with, you know, the, the, the IOU model, you know, in, in California as far as the grid operator and then, you know, for for us as a CCA, um, you know, we're really focused on, you know, how are we meeting our communities, um, you know, energy supply needs through, um, you know, renewable sources and, and integrating storage. So we've got our goals around supply and then, you know, kind of combining those two different, um, you know, trajectories and, and really integrating with uh, critical facilities in our community. And, and looking for opportunities to, to, to basically, you know, provide direct local benefits through these, these different kind of channels. Next slide. So, you know, really where we're looking at as far as the you know, objectives of the, the, the project, we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, to, to take advantage of basically co-locating, um, you know, what would otherwise be sort of a wholesale solar and storage project, and, and by co-locating that at a, a critical facility and adding the, you know, the microgrid capabilities, 
um, you know, we're, we're able to kind of, you know, leverage a lot more benefits than just kind of having standalone generation, um, you know, and, and by it being, you know, something on the customer side of the meter, it's, it's enhancing our overall power portfolio. And so, you know, the, the project overall is really looking at trying to um, demonstrate a replicable business model so that, you know, these kinds of projects um, can move forward and, you know, and, and continue to be you know, hopefully more common, uh, you know, across the, the state and, and eventually the country, um, you know, and, and really kind of trying to get, you know, those, those range of benefits as far as, you know, developing local projects, which provides economic benefits, um, you know, reducing emissions through renewable energy development, um, as well as, um, you know, uh, providing energy resilience and emergency response capabilities and, you know, part of the replication of this project, you know, is, is to look at, you know, how do you have the operating agreements, um, you know, and, and you know, put the technical as well as the sort of logistical uh, elements of, of being able to, to manage this kind of uh, cooperative project uh, between a, a, a critical facility, a, a, a CCA, um, and, a, and an investor and utility on the grid side. Next slide. So the, the the project partners um, that are that are helping move this forward are the the Shot City Research Center at Humboldt State University, who's um, the recipient of the, the California Energy Commission grant um, uh, that's providing about half the funding, and they're you know the, the the technology integrator and and just overall project lead on moving this forward. Um, you know, PG&E is another key partner, and and we're we're using their distribution system you know as the the, the the poles and wires of the microgrid, um, and so they're they're a, a central partner and are also providing Epic funds, um, you know, that they have access to to, to support the project. And then Redcliffe Energy Authority, as the CCA, we're we're actually going to be the the owner and operator of the the generation and storage, um, and then we're contributing about um, you know, the other half of the the funding for the project. Um, and then the, the County of Humboldt is the site host, which, which owns and operates the airport. Um, there's other customers, which, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about that are, that are not, you know, that are benefiting from the project, although they're, they're not, they're sort of upstream. And so they're, they're, uh, their need for involvement in, in the actual project is fairly limited, but they'll be, they'll be beneficiaries. Um, and then TRC is, is, um, you know, supporting the, the business case evaluation as well as cybersecurity. And you'll, you'll hear about that business case evaluation. In this presentation, and then you know, obviously we've got uh, technology vendors. Um, Tesla is uh, going to be installing the the solar and, and battery systems, and then Tracer Engineering Labs uh, on the control front. Next slide. So you know, we're really you know, looking at you know our our local goals and, and you know why we're, we're we're trying to move this project forward. You know, we're we're a, a rural, isolated community, and and we've got very um, you know limited uh, transmission in and out of the county, and and um, you know we're we're vulnerable to you know the, the sort of full range of possible um, you know natural disasters, and you know a, a, as well as um, you know the increasing risk from wildfires and and um, you know grid disruptions associated with that. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we really want to see um, resiliency as, as a key um, a key driver of what we're doing. And I think, you know, we, we also have ambitious renewable energy goals. And so I think for us, you know, really this project is at the heart of, you know, a desire to say, you know, we need to get to, you know, a renewable energy future, but that renewable energy future needs to be more reliable and more robust and more resilient, you know, not less resilient. And so I think, um, you know, really looking at ways where we're, we're both achieving our renewable energy goals and improving the resilience of the grid, not detracting from that, because obviously, um, you know, energy security and resilience, uh, you know, is, is a key factor for, for communities and, you know, it could be a matter of life or death. And so we really want to, you know, not, not have resiliency, um, you know, be uh, at the expense of our renewable energy goals or vice versa. Uh, next slide, and I think that I'll be passing off to Jim to, to provide a little bit more technical details about the project. Great. Thank you very much, Matthew, um, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. So I'm going to talk about the, the design of the system uh, and the operational agreements that have been necessary and that we're working on 
and then I will pass it off to Carmen and she'll be going into the details of the business model. So this graphic here gives you uh, uh, an idea of, the, of our progress to date on these key task areas. Uh, it's in terms of the technical design, um, it's really essentially done at this point. We have 100% design drawings. Uh, we've submitted our permit package to the, the county building department here in Humboldt County. Um, and we have a 100% uh, functional design specification that is under review. So that's the, um, the specification that Schweitzer Engineering is following to program the control software. Um, the, under the operational agreements, um, we have a number of things in place, some of which are complete and some of which are, are still in process. So we have executed a couple of interconnection agreements for this project with PG&E, um, and, and those were executed between RCEA um, as the owner of those generators and PG&E. So there's, you'll see in a moment, there's both a wholesale generator, um, which is a battery and, and storage system, or PV and, and storage system, and a, uh, uh, a NEM generator uh, that I'll talk briefly about in a moment. Um, we have been uh, going through the, the new resources implementation process with KISO. We will be um, participating in the KISO market with the wholesale generator. And so we've now completed our bucket one deliverables there. Um, FAA approval, so this is on an airport property, uh, which um, you know sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for. Uh, we we never, uh, never quite imagined how, how complicated it would be to get through the FAA approval process, but we've been uh, working on that uh, for quite some time and, and uh, that's nearly complete. We expect to have full approval by early next year. Um, and then uh, we've been working with PG&E on a microgrid operating agreement, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, the last thing I'll say uh, is that the, the last box there, project build, we really won't get into that today, but um, we, we have contractual dates with our vendors. Um, construction will begin in April of next year, and we expect to have our commercial operating date in uh, Q4 of next year. Next slide, please. So uh, this gives you uh, kind of a, an artist uh, view of, of the system. So this is out at the um, <coughs> Redwood Coast Humboldt County Airport. Um, the, we're, we are at the end of the James Creek 1103 distribution circuit on pg es distribution system. And the microgrid circuit, when the recloser opens, will isolate about 20 retail accounts at the end of that circuit. So there'll, there'll be 20 retail accounts on the microgrid. Uh, the two key customers on the microgrid are the airport itself and all of their operations um, owned, owned and operated by the County of Humboldt. And then adjacent to the airport is a US Coast Guard station. And both of these uh, facilities are, are critical to emergency services to Humboldt County. Uh, and, and that's why uh, you know, it's a, a, big, a big driver for, for doing the microgrid at this location. Um, so this, as we mentioned, this will be the first front of the meter multi-customer microgrid on, on pg e system. Um, features a 2.2 megawatt PV array that's DC coupled to a four hour battery. Um, and again, that'll be used for uh, in, under normal grid connected operation for KISO wholesale market participation. And then there's a, a, a piece of that, uh, of that array, that, that rectangular PV array that you can see in the picture there. A small slice of that is uh, uh, that's uh, rated at 300 kW AC um, is going to be net metered and that's going to be offsetting electric bills at the airport, and that essentially is the lease payment for the property that we're using for this project. The property owns, uh, is owned by the county. Uh, and then there are microgrid controllers that will allow us to island. Um, and I, I'll just add that, you know, we, we will have the ability to island for uh, very extended periods, under most cases for days or perhaps even weeks. Um, and the reason we have that much resilience with a 100% with renewable microgrid, just PV and battery, is that the system is, is, is quite oversized with regard to the load on the microgrid circuit. So those 20 accounts, the peak demand is about 330 kW. Um, and the, you know, the, it, we're about 2.5 megawatts if you add the, the, uh, the DC coupled plus the net metered system. So it's really quite large with respect to the, uh, to the loads on the, on the microgrid circuit. Um, and that, you know, we're using it during, during normal grid operation uh, grid connected operation to participate in the wholesale market. So that's why it's, it's, it's sized that way. Um, and, but it does give us gr uh, great resilience. And it also simplifies some of the um, protection uh, challenges uh, associated with um, inverter based uh, generators and uh, the difficulty in, in, in um, meeting fault current requirements. Uh, next slide, please. 
so the technical design, uh, you know, there's two, two modes for the system, grid connected mode, islanded mode. Um, I've already mentioned what, you know, the grid connected mode, wholesale participation. We'll mention that um, we did choose through our interconnection process with, with PG&E under the wholesale distribution tariff to constrain our interconnection to uh, the, the numbers you see there um, to import and export. And we did that in order to mitigate um, upgrades that would have been required to the distribution system in order to handle the full nameplate capacity of, of our system. So by uh, constraining the output and the input, uh, import and export, to those values that you see there, we were able to mitigate that cost and, um, and really um, you know, make, make, the, make the economics viable for our project. Uh, and then obviously it's a microgrid. Uh, the, the other mode is islanded mode. Um, so in grid connected mode, RCEA you know, is the owner and operator of the wholesale generator and um, PG&E will not, will not have any control over the generator, um, and, you know, unless it was some sort of emergency or something. But, um, basically, day-to-day -day operation, RCA is in complete control, and it's just participating in the wholesale market. When we go into island mode, however, PG&E, as the distribution system operator, is responsible for serving their customers safely and reliably and with, with proper quality. And they have control over when we go into island mode, which will only be in emergency situations where, the, where, the, where there's a grid outage. And uh, they also will have control of the generator in island mode. Actually, the generator really in island mode um, will be will be automatically controlled by the software and will you know form the grid and just meet the load. So there's nothing really PG is going to be doing with it. But responsibility from a responsibility standpoint, they are in control. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is a, a simplified uh, single line diagram. I'm not going to go through all the details here. I just point out a few things. Uh, that I want to highlight. So I, I will uh, kind of cover the, the boxes. So the orange boxes are the <clears throat> existing accounts on, on the circuit, those uh, about 20 or so accounts in total. Um, the blue boxes are uh, things that are being added that are associated with the electrical power, either generation or new load. There's, there's EV charging that we're not going to talk about today. Um, and so that new generation is owned and operated by our CEA. And then the green boxes are <clears throat> um, part of the control system. And what I really want to highlight here is that dashed line that you see that's about a third of the way up the, um, uh, or about a third, uh, you know, an upper third of the diagram. Um, we, we'll refer to that as the bright clean line. And that denotes that everything above that line is owned and operated and, and PG&E is owned and operated by PG&E. They have full responsibility for it. Everything below the line is owned and operated by PG&E's customers, um, namely for the, what's important with, with regard to this project is RCEA as owner and operator of those, of those generators. And <clears throat> so it's been very important in this project to identify the roles and responsibilities for these two entities. And then we decided to separate the hardware and the software associated with this project according to those roles and responsibilities. So where RCEA has, uh, has uh, you know, a, a res the responsibility for certain things, certain pieces of equipment, certain software, et cetera, they own and control that a piece of hardware and a piece of software. Um, so you'll see there in those green boxes, the, the two to the sort of to the right. Um, so the one on, above the line says PG&E microgrid controller. The one below the line says RCEA generation controller. This is basically the microgrid controller. And this could have been done with a single controller and it actually would have been a bit simpler and would have lowered our, our upfront cost a little bit. Um, however, we decided to, to separate this, bifurcate this into two separate hardware controllers with two separate sets of software. And that way, uh, in PG&E's software, uh, they will own and operate their, their controller. It controls when, when the system islands, and if we're in island mode, it's responsible for the, you know, the quality and the safety on the circuit. The RCEA generator controls the generators during grid operation. And, and PG&E has nothing to do with how RCEA operates that during normal grid operation uh, when they're participating in the wholesale market. The real importance here is that it simplifies things from a contractual and a legal and an ownership standpoint and from an ongoing operations and maintenance standpoint. So if RCEA needs to upgrade their, their hardware or their software, let's say they wanna change the algorithm that is responsible for how they participate in the wholesale market. 
they have total control over the piece of hardware and software, and they can up, they can do that without without you know bothering or having to interact with PG&E. Um, now, if it's going to impact the way that the microgrid operates, obviously we'd have to go back and 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 make sure that everything is you know is handled properly. But um, for things that RCA is responsible for, they have total total control over that. And you can just imagine how complicated it would be if if the one controller was owned by either entity and the other entity needed to change the software. You have to get approval. You have to, you know, it would be a long drawn out process that would be very complicated. So that was a, an important decision that was made and, and one that I think is, um, we, we see as being a kind of a model for replication. Next slide, please. So uh, I'll talk a little bit now about the operating agreements um, and, and um, in that regard, some more about replication and, and kind of the value of this project toward replication. So this is a unique partnership between an IOU and a CCA. Um, and I think, you know, there, there's a number of things that make it unique, but I think that, that with what's, what's important with regard to, um, to this discussion here is that RCEA, as, as the CCA, will own and operate um, DERs uh, that will, during normal operation, they have complete control over and they'll be participating in, in the wholesale market. And P, they're not under contract to PG&E. PG&E has no control or say over how they manage those. However, when we go into island mode, those generators will form the microgrid and serve the uh, the PG PG&E's distribution circuit. There are still you know 20 customers that are PG&E customers on their circuit, and PG&E is still responsible for service to those customers. Um, so that requires a lot of real special attention. It's very different than just a standard DER interconnection, and it has required us to uh, through the design process. You know we need to make make sure it's safe, reliable, functional. And it must seamlessly mesh with PG&E's existing system, and I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. Um, but so there's been a lot of back and a lot of iteration, and, and I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment as well. Um, so that's on the design piece of things. On the contractual side of things, um, we've also needed to work very closely in in, in figuring out what, you know what what sort of agreements need to be negotiated here and and and, and established for not only for the installation of the system, but for the operation of it and maintenance of it over a 25 year period. Um, and and, and umbrella, uh, you know, an umbrella over all of this, this, this work has been that, you know, the focus has been to make sure we have a functional pilot project here in Humboldt County for RCEA and RCEA's customers and for the airport and these critical facilities, and that it's functional for PG&E as the distribution system operator and for RCEA as the, as the CCA. Um, but in addition to making sure that we have what we need from a from a design and, a, and an agreement standpoint for our pilot project, we've also had an eye toward how can this be replicated, and and that really has been um, really the you know that we really upped the ante with this with the microgrid proceeding and all that's happening right now and all the focus on microgrids and PG&E offering up this this uh, community microgrid enablement program, which in large part is being modeled after this project. Um, so our our focus has been how do we get this done. And how do we get it done in a way that can be standardized and easily replicated and streamlined for future community microgrid projects? Uh, next, next slide, please. So I have a couple more uh, slides here, and then I'll turn it over to um, to Carmen. Um, so, with regard to the design work, um, you know, the Shot Center has served as is serving as the as RCEA's owner and engineer. We're also the technology integrator. Uh, we're working very closely with our technology partners, Tesla and Schweitzer. Um, we're working very closely with PG&E. And basically, you know, we've been working on putting together the uh, sort of the proposed configurations, architecture, um, algorithms in terms of control. We've put, put these things together in terms of a single line diagram, a communications block diagram, a uh, site plan, and then a concept of operations document, um, which really just you know, defined how the system would function and operate, when it would island, how it would island, is it seamless, is it break before make, all of those sorts of things, how does the protection work, all of those things laid out in the concept of operations document that we came to, it iterated, and, and all of these things, we typically have put forth a, a proposal and then worked with PG&E and RCA to iterate and come to agreement on what, what meets everybody's needs. Um, and, uh, and that concept of operations document is then fed into the functional design specification that I mentioned earlier that, that Schweitzer is now programming into the software. So there's been, you know, this collaboration and this iteration. And again, all along, you know, all along the way thinking, okay, 
if we're if we're kind of you know cutting new ground in new territory here and spending a lot of time and effort um, trying to get this stuff right, how can we do it in a way that doesn't you don't have to reinvent the wheel for every new project that can be standardized and replicated and streamlined? Um, uh, next slide, please. So um, the RCAM microgrid operating agreement. Um, so in terms of operating agreements, this, this is um, an, an overarching or an umbrella agreement that, that um, covers this microgrid project. And the idea is that this would be the type of, of agreement, I think, that, that future multi-customer front of the meter microgrid, community microgrids would, would um, you know, execute and, 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 and engage with PG&E in, 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 you know, executing a, an agreement like this. It's an umbrella that covers a lot of the individual agreements and things that have, that have been decided upon for the project. So this includes the interconnection agreements that I mentioned for the two, two, the two generators, uh, which are just standard. And one's a wholesale distribution tariff, the other one's a Rule 21 um, NEM metered system, or NEM system. Uh, and then a special facilities agreement, uh, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, and that's an existing, you know, that's basically under PG&E's Rule 2. Um, and then operational roles and responsibilities. So this is the area that I was just talking about is the really kind of figuring out how these two entities um, interact over the long haul um, for a project like this. And you'll see under there, so CONOPS is one piece of that, but the other piece talks about pro pro protocols and procedures. And so there, you know, th th this is kind of the, the type of work we're getting into. And again, collaborating with PG&E and working out these details is how um, will the operational activities be handled over the life of this project? Things like what happens if there's an incident at the project? Um, who, how is that reporting done? Who, who notifies who? How do people respond? What about maintenance and testing? Who has responsibility? What about access and clearances? Who has access to what equipment? Um, you know, uh, who needs clearances? All those sorts of things. Um, these are these are you know this is down in the really down in the details in the weeds and and things you, you might not think about with a project like this but because there are two entities that own and operate and are responsible for you know a very important system that is serving these customers for you know reliable safe electricity we really have to you know get into the weeds like this and and work out these details and the hope is that by doing this for this project that we kind of establish. Some, uh, you know, again, something that could be standardized so that the next project that comes through, there's a standard, you know, format and a standard process. And there, you know, there may be still be some negotiation and decisions that need to be made, but you're not, you're not starting from scratch. Uh, next slide, please. And I think this is my last slide here, and I'll turn it over to Carmen. Um, so I'll end with talking a little bit more about the tariff work and um, some of you may have seen some of our earlier presentations. We gave a presentation um, at, a, at a CPUC workshop um, about a year or so ago um, about the project and about tariffs. And, um, you know, tariffs is kind of a broad term. It's really any contractual agreement between the IOU and their customers. Um, so it can cover things like the, the operating agreement types of stuff I was just talking about. But it also obviously covers things like, you know, um, compensation and rates and how much you pay for things and that sort of thing. Um, in that regard, in terms of compensation in, in either direction, whether it's from RCA to pg e or the other way, there, there were three areas that we identified as being important with regard to tariffs. That was micro, a microgrid infrastructure cost recovery tariff, an islanded energy tariff, and an islanded grid services tariff. Um, and this has really evolved since that last presentation that we gave. So for the microgrid infrastructure cost recovery tariff, we identified that the Rule 2 Special Facilities Agreement really is is well suited to cover any of so this is this is the importance of this is to to um, compensate pg e for any upgrades that need to be made to the distribution circuit to allow the islanding of this community microgrid this front of the meter community microgrid and um you know the, the question here is you know well, who pays for it and 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 you know do all the cust do, do all ratepayers pay for it or do, do just the customers served by the microgrid well so this is this was you know set up through the special facilities agreement um, PG&E is looking at, um, you know, through their microgrid enablement program, actually covering part or all of the cost for these distribution system upgrades associated with islanding, not with the DERs in general, but just with the islanding aspect. So, um, you know, that's kind of part of this as well. Um, so that's, this is, this is covered under an existing tariff. The second piece, the island energy tariff, 
what we found out as we as we work through this, since we're participating in the Kaiso market, um, we will always be in the Kaiso market, even when we're an island in mode. We're still in the Kaiso market, even when we have a, an outage. We are still in the Kaiso market, and we're settled within the Kaiso market. So there there need there does not need to be any compensation for energy, even in island mode, from PG&E to RCEA. Um, because we're, RCA will be compensated through the Kaiso market structure, and you don't want to, you know, double sort of be double dipping in that regard. Uh, so that brings us to the last case, the Islanded Grid Services tariff, and the idea here was to compensate the the, uh, the the generation, the grid forming generator owner of that grid forming generator that's providing uh, grid forming services and and you know grid stability services beyond the energy component, um, and what so we had looked at doing a kind of a long-term compensation. What came out of the, what we've explored here is that the amount of value there was very little because we're, we're, we were only going to be islanded for, for very few hours of a year, hopefully not very much at all. Depends on, on how much the grid is down, but it, if you look at historically, it's very few hours. And so the amount of money train, changing hand for those services is going to be very small. It's not, doesn't make or break the economics of the project, and the transaction cost in terms of setting up a way of tracking that and compensating for that is expensive. So it didn't really make a lot of sense. In addition, what PG&E has, has, has figured out as they've done this project and looked at their community microgrid enablement program is that the real barrier to these microgrids is the upfront cost. And so they're proposing through the microgrid enablement program to cover either part or all of the cost, again, for those grid, for the upgrades to the distribution system to allow islanding to occur. And that then becomes the compensation, and they're proposing not to give compensation for these grid services during, um, you know, sort of over the long haul. And so basically now our project, we are working with them to negotiate a similar sort of upfront compensation for this project in lieu of some ongoing compensation. And um, so, uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that, and um, I hope I didn't take too long. I'll pass it on to Carmen. Thanks, Jim. Uh, no, we're right on time. Um, so I, that was a great overview of the project and sort of uh, all of the actual functionality of, of how we plan to operate. I think we're going to move to this next uh, section on the, the business model. So this is a CEC-funded project, and as Jim mentioned, you know, uh, one of the primary uh, objectives coming out of this is how do we take the work on this project and look at how it can be replicated uh, in for future microgrids. So this is a, a concerted effort that we had as a team and developed a business model working group that went in parallel with the tariff group that, that Jim just talked about because they're kind of inexorably linked. Um, and we have gone, we have sort of a three-step process here, uh, we've gone through developing our model for how we're going to evaluate uh, the RCAM project as the base case for consideration. And then uh, also determining what models we want to look at for replication um, evaluation and looking at how this could, could be um, a basis for future projects. So we've done that work uh, to date, and uh, we'll be sharing some of the results of that here today. And really, we're at stage two now. This, this second step is peer review and feedback. So this, this is the first time we have presented this information, and it's a really great opportunity uh, to engage with the folks on this call and, and within the microgrid community to start to get feedback, stakeholder feedback. So, uh, we're going to look forward to the questions today and then following up because that will really form some of our final uh, business modeling results in this project and um, we're going to uh, be reporting on that over time in, in the years to come here. So, so with that, um, you know, we started with how do we really evaluate the RCAM project as a base case. And the approach that we decided to go with was looking at sort of an, an itemized project cost and benefit um, analysis. So we did a cash flow analysis and looked at sort of the revenue less the uh, capital and operating expenses. So the, this is sort of the basis of the model. What we've shown here are the different categories of what we've captured in this base case. 
Now, you know, it's a just an annual cash flow model discounted to today, and, and we used a lifetime of 25 years for the project um, for this base case analysis. So, you know, since the project is not yet built um, and we're not actually participating in the market yet, what we've done is base the cost to date on the engineering design. As Jim indicated, we're at 100% design. We have all of those values um, and, and have used that as uh, the input to date. And then the revenue we projected based on our CEA scheduling coordinators uh, projection, working with the KISO um, and looking at sort of our analysis for this wholesale participation of, of what we can um, have this project um, uh, participate in the, in the wholesale market. So these are all forward-looking uh, projections, and we will be revising and updating these uh, as we get full construction costs as we start to operate uh, the RCAM microgrid. So just to show sort of the output of this initial um, base case modeling. So this is a base case. These are actual costs and projected revenues. We don't have any resiliency values, reliability values in this initial run. Um, and, and, you know, what we were trying to do is say, what are the, uh, the monetized and, and forecasted uh, revenues and expenditures and have a very sort of clean look at that. Um, Jim mentioned this as well, that the DER, uh, this is the yellow uh, bar on the cost, the uh, storage and solar microgrid assets. Um, were oversized, and they were oversized in, as intended to meet our CEA's objectives of uh, uh, local and renewable resources. So the, with the idea that this, this project would be um, uh, participating in the wholesale market. Now, um, we do you know, expect that number to probably come down over time, but we wanted to model today's uh, uh, cost for this project. And, you know, what we can see here is if you look on the right hand side, you know, the DER costs are the largest component of the costs. Um, the microgrid controller and the EPC and, and interconnection costs sort of combined um, uh, is the next chunk. And the O&M is, is relatively small uh, as projected for, for the costs. <clears throat> on the revenue side, which is the benefit column on the left, um, we've captured all of the uh, planned participation and benefits associated with um, wholesale market participation. And with that, when you look at this on the overall um, project lifetime, uh, we have a benefit cost of about 0.5. So with a gap of uh, $5 million. Coincidentally enough, uh, this project is uh, is fortunate enough to be funded through a CEC grant uh, to help offset some of those costs as we're gonna talk about uh, what are the sort of longer term and uh, broader benefits for the RCA and Humboldt community associated with this project. So we took a look at this and, and you know we have a gap in the base case of $5.1 million. We wanna sort of get a sense of what that looked like because this is a front of the meter multi-customer microgrids, you've got your immediate uh, um, customers that will benefit from the existence of this microgrid, but then you've got what this microgrid uh, sited at the, at the airport that serves a rural community, what this, um, this value can really contribute to the overarching community. Um, so we kind of did a, a look at, all right, well, if that was that gap, what would, what would the impact be you know, for the RCEA or Humboldt County um, community. If you look at it on the community level, it's $38 in total for the 25-year project lifetime. Would you pay an additional $38 to sort of have the benefit of this microgrid? If you look at it on a per RCA account, it's about uh, a little over $3 per year of additional um, uh, sort of cost to achieve some of the resiliency from this microgrid. And then if you look at it from the perspective of the airport, you know, it's about, it's a little over a dollar per uh, airport passenger trip based on today's, um, uh, um, maybe not today's, but but typical airport um, uh, trips at the Arcata Airport. So with this, with this sort of in mind, what the project team did is take a look at what are all of the potential benefits that the uh, community can um, 
expect to receive based on the existence of this microgrid above and beyond you know, the local um, uh, ener uh, renewable energy and storage um, uh, DERs. So in this case, uh, we kind of identified all of these in this honeycomb fashion, but the two highlighted are the particular resiliency values that we decided as a project team that we wanted to uh, take a look at and, and try to model what that impact uh, those particular um, benefit areas would, would provide. Now that's the supporting the Coast Guard emergency rescue because we've got a Coast Guard facility and then sustaining the commercial business activities during the outage, which includes uh, commercial business at the airport. So just want to highlight the range of what we discussed and then what we're going to present today in terms of what we actually uh, sought to quantify. So as, for, as part of this uh, process, um, what we did is take a look at, all right, there's, there's a number of different benefit types. What are the, the tools uh, and um, you know, methods that have been used out there in the industry? They're well vetted, uh, industry accepted tools that actually apply to the specific project um, characteristics uh, at the RCAM project. So uh, in this case, we were focusing on three particular uh, resiliency uh, areas. One, of the loss of critical services. Two, the loss of economic activities. And three, the sort of avoided outage costs. And what we, uh, what we zeroed in on here was using three different uh, tools and methods to kind of characterize the resiliency value for um, a project at the um, Arcata Airport. So uh, many folks, I, I'm sure, have taken a look at the FEMA tool. That's a, it's a very um, uh, frequently used um, tool to evaluate sort of the emergency aspects of, um, of resiliency. And in this case, what we've listed here are the different inputs that we used and the value and category that we were trying to capture in terms of the, the resiliency benefits. Uh, so the color coding is associated with the blue is the loss of critical services. In this case, this is associated, uh, and we calculated this with the FEMA tool uh, focused on the Coast Guard loss of services. And you can see that in the blue bar chart. Um, the, the green is sort of the value of lost time and the value of uh, lost revenues. And uh, those are, 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 are captured um, separately uh, in, the, in the bar chart here too as well. And then the last one is the ICE calculator output of the interruption costs um, for customers. This is also a commonly used tool. And you can see that the customers, um, um, the value is significant relative to the overall um, value that we've calculated here. I'll note that the customer um, uh, interruption calculator that we used here is, uh, is only capturing the customers on this um, multi-customer microgrid that are not the airport or the Coast Guard. Those values are captured in the airport specific modeling that we did as well as the FEMA. So it's pretty significant when you start to think about this as a multi-customer microgrid what the collective value of resiliency uh, begins to look like. So um, when we applied these, this modeling of uh, resiliency value, kind of very targeted to the specific uh, RCAM project, what we found is that that uh, added a significant um, bump to the benefit uh, for, for the resiliency for this project. So the gap goes from 5.1 1 million in this case to 2.9 as a remaining gap or, or less than $2 per year per our CEA account. Um, now, reflecting back, this is only, we only ca calculated in this two of the potential uh, resiliency value um, benefits from this microgrid. So this is our base case. This is, this is the RCAM base case that we are, um, taking from this project and looking at how do we replicate this in, in a viable uh, business models going forward? Where might this be applicable to, um, to other sites? So taking this base case, um, what we decided to do is uh, characterize this base case with the idea of 
any replication scenario would be a front of the meter microgrid and it would be a multi-customer microgrid. And in all the cases that we have looked at, we are looking at a renewable-based microgrid, recognizing that in many cases there will be existing or planned um, uh, fossil or backup. But for, for our particular modeling purposes, we looked at um, front of the meter, multi-customer, and renewable. So we focused in on here two different replication scenarios. One is critical facilities and a cluster of critical facilities. And two is a natural disaster scenario. So we're gonna go through both of those. And then uh, what we've highlighted here in terms of some additional value streams, and by no means is this um, comprehensive, and uh, but this is the, uh, the idea of the islanding premium. And we define an islanding premium as the incremental cost of enabling uh, islanding and gaining these resiliency values uh, by uh, creating a microgrid with either existing or planned DERs. So this is what Matthew referred to in the beginning of how can we create resiliency by a microgrid when we know that we're looking for um, uh, DERs and wholesale participation of those DERs. And then the last one is infrastructure deferral. I know um, a number of folks have looked at this and it is an important uh, value consideration for uh, future microgrids at the front of the meter configuration. So moving through this, uh, the critical facilities, we looked at a cluster scenario. Uh, you know, I think the approach here, and I'll go through this, is to develop a, a, an a and aggregate a proxy resiliency value for different types of critical facilities so that we can look at different modeling scenarios to, to see what would be a viable uh, business model versus the, for a front of the meter microgrid or what might be uh, otherwise captured with some other a different microgrid model. Some of the considerations and limitations on this are that the, uh, the facilities must be on the same distribution feeder. I know that seems like it goes without saying, but it's a really important component. There must be space uh, for hosting DER generation. Uh, Jim showed the, the graphic it, we, for a large scale solar installation. That's a, quite a bit of space. And then, of course, the distribution feeder itself needs to be, uh, you know, we need to look at the condition of that and the current uh, capacity available on that feeder. Other things like uh, siting it at a feeder termination point rather than in line um, locations along the feeder uh, are other important considerations. So with this, uh, with this approach, what we, we did is use some of the models that, that we had uh, worked with to identify a proxy resiliency value for different types of facilities. Uh, this sort of captures what population size is served by a different, uh, cr each different critical facility. And then also uh, things like the distance to the, uh, those facilities by the customer served as well. So this is particularly important for rural rural communities. So just a couple um, outputs we wanted to show, you know, this is at really looking at the resiliency value of a front of the meter microgrid supporting municipal and emergency um, facilities. And in this case, we focused on a kind of a municipal look of civic functions. So police, fire department, command center, a cluster and a line. We see this a lot in um, city centers and, and so forth. And uh, looked at what that, picking that up with a front of the meter um, microgrid would look like. And we still have a gap uh, to address even with this uh, resiliency value that we've calculated here. So maybe the front of the meter, you know, either we need to be able to pick up more, um, a larger cluster, uh, or this is, this might be better served by a behind the meter uh, microgrid. So we, we look, we've, you know, another example that we looked at is taking this one step further and saying, okay, well, what if we look at a medium-sized hospital that serves a population of about 200,000 in this case? And, you know, uh, in this case, the resiliency value is significantly um, increased and starts to look like a whole, a, a much stronger business case to explore for the fun, front of the meter configuration. And I'll just note that this, this particular model is just the hospital. Uh, if you start to pick up other facilities uh, nearby, um, and we've seen this in microgrid configurations across the country, this is where the front of the meter model uh, has, um, has potential to explore for replication. 
So the next uh, scenario that we looked at for replication was the natural disaster uh, case study here. Uh, you know, we're seeing this, we're experiencing this uh, throughout the country. And the focus here is really looking at this as, uh, how do we look at a sustained outage? And, and you know, you could pick any number of days, uh, you know, to model this. What we did for this scenario is we looked at a two week or 336 hours of continuous outage and to estimate the resiliency benefit here. And this two week planning horizon is being increasingly used for state level and military emergency planning. So that was the, that was the threshold we looked at. And I think you know, we, anybody on this call could reflect on, on sort of the regions across the country today that are experiencing severe outages, one, two week outages, and not just a single time, but you know, it could be uh, multiple years, consecutive years. So what we did here is to take a look at um, a single event, uh, looking at one two-week event in year eight of a microgrid 25-year um, uh, life. So taking a look at this, it's it's you know interesting here. We're not capturing all of the value, but but still there's a, a bit of a remaining gap um, with a single event during a 25-year 20 microgrid of, uh, lifetime. So we looked at some other scenarios as well. And if you look at a, a in this natural disaster case study, uh, two week of, um, events, and you look at two of them in consecutive years, uh, these days that's not unheard of. So immediately when you start to see multiple events, whether they be consecutive years or um, you know throughout the lifetime of the microgrid, the resiliency value for the community in a front of the meter scenario uh, really begins to, um, uh, demonstrate a more uh, viable business model for, for planning purposes. And I think with regard to the RCAM uh, project, this is, this is a scenario that uh, the, the community is uh, keenly uh, concerned about and, and the resiliency values certainly prove out here. So beyond the, the um, critical facilities and the natural disaster scenario, there are other value considerations that that uh, that we really need to take a look at as well. And you know, the two that we wanted to point out today, and 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 that we are working, you know, in partnership with PG&E uh, through this project, really looking at how to prioritize the non-wires alternative locations. Uh, you know, where we have an aging grid. Uh, Non-wires alternatives are being looked at across the country, and how do we look at front of the meter solutions as a way to not only meet the primary objective of uh, the, the the grid need, but also to provide an enhanced reliability, uh, excuse me, enhanced re resiliency for the local community. And this is where the efforts of the Community Microgrid Enablement Program, or CMAP, that PG&E has under uh, review now. Uh, is really coming to fruition and looking at this idea of how does the utility be able to provide um, uh, the support and the compensation to offset the premium uh, needed to island and in front of the meter configuration. Um, so we're going to be looking more at this as the program uh, begins to roll out and how this can contribute to improving the, the business model for front of the meter microgrids. And beyond these two considerations, um, you know, we are certainly at the stakeholder outreach perspective and we're looking to explore with many of you on this call, other value streams for this type of microgrid configuration. And, you know, for example, there are, there are potential operational uh, benefits for managing customers during ongoing maintenance and outage um, uh, conditions when you need to bring down the, the sections of the grid to do maintenance. You know, where are these types of front of the meter microgrids uh, going to be a viable option for future replication? So look forward to that discussion um, with this community. So with that, uh, we'll wrap it up. I think we've shared a number of the lessons learned from uh, the work that we've done today. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to the project be, being uh, uh, breaking ground uh, Q2 next year. We will be continuing the business model work and uh, look forward to your questions um, going forward. Um, 
And with that, uh, Matthew, Jim, any final thoughts? Good, I'm interested if there's questions. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you very much, Matthew, Jim, and Carmen. This was an excellent presentation. And I don't know if we've ever gotten quite so many questions during a presentation as we have. So we're not gonna be able to get through all of them, but we can certainly go a little over the hour if people can stay. So let's get right into some of them. Um, there were a few questions about ownership structure and uh, who's operating what. So Lorenzo Christoph asks, did you consider a third party operator of the microgrid and island mode rather than PG&E? And will PG&E as operator also control loads? And then we have also a question from Dave Freibush at Peninsula Clean Energy. Can you explain the ownership structure for how RCEA owns the resource? Is it on RCEA's balance sheet? So um, whether you considered a third party operator rather than PG&E and will PG&E control loads? And then how does RCEA fit in? Matt, Matthew, you should yeah. definitely take the second one there. <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can answer that one first because it's straightforward. So, so we're going to have a long-term lease with the county um, for using the land. And basically, our lease payment is going to be the power output from the, the net energy metered sort of subarray of the, the PV system. And so, you know, the, there's going to be some power that will be, you know, under sort of normal conditions will be, you know, just powering the airport as a, as a typical uh, NEM PV system. And that's our that's our rent um, for the, the the life of the project, um, and then we will we will just own and operate um, you know all the 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 microgrid pieces below that line that that Jim showed as far as the 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 control system sort of for the, the base control system for the the, the battery storage and, and PV array, and then we'll own the the PV system in the the, the battery system, you know, we, we talked about, you know, different models where it would actually, you know, be like a, you know, having a third party developer. And so it's more of a PPA structure, but um, in this case, we're actually just going to be paying for that with them. Um, we're financing it through a USDA loan and, and then obviously the, the CEC grant funds. Well, let me follow up on that a little bit uh, while you're on that then. Uh, Lorenzo Christoph also asks in island mode, is RCEA still the provider of retail kilowatt hours to the customers? I presume that's the case, but do you want to get into that? Yeah, and, and, and that's, um, yeah, you know, we're, we're go, well, I was going to say, where Jim kind of highlighted that, you know, the after kind of going through some iterations, the, 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 the path of least resistance sort of seems to be to just, you know, from the customer standpoint, you know, have have nothing changing when when it's in island mode or not. So it's really you know truly sort of upstream from the customers as far as um, you know the actual um, delivery of power um, you know into the 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 grid and and from a you know a customer perspective. I don't know if you want to add anything there, Jim. Uh, no, I, I guess you know I, I think in terms of. Um, Oh, well, we didn't really explore a third party entity to to sort of own and or, or to operate the system in in, in island mode. Um, I, I'm not sure how that would work. I mean, it would still be on PG&E's distribution circuit. So, um, I mean, we are a third party and, and um, you know, I don't know I, that that that's that's not something we explored. Um, it, it, uh, the um, in terms of, you know, there, there's, there's, there is no control of the load. There, there's not really load control other than the EV charging that we're, that we're adding in ourselves as part of the project. Um, so basically the system will, will go into grid forming mode and it will, uh, it will provide as much resilience as it can. And as I said, under most situations, that is, we're talking about days and weeks of, of backup. Um, in the worst case uh, weather situation where there's really not much solar and the battery is is not really well charged. It, it, it could be shorter. And if if there's not enough um, generation and storage to provide the load, at some point the battery will be discharged. The microgrid will shut down to protect the battery, and basically there will be an outage on that circuit. And and the and the, the two real critical facilities, the the uh, the airport and the coast guard, they do have backup diesel generators. So. Um, those are just being relegated to to deep backup, 
and you know we're, we're essentially having a, a renewable sort of renewable backup power for the most part with with a deep backup of those diesel generators um the other thing is in, in, in an extreme emergency that would be uh you know might be be on the order of weeks like uh like carmen was mentioning in that case we will have a merge, emergency procedures where we may manually shed load and just decide to to you know to trip breakers or 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 disconnect switches and say you know this facility in this situation is not critical we're just we're shutting it down and we're we're still we're, we're saving the renewable power that's available for those critical loads over a long period so that's that's kind of sort of how that's being handled great thanks so a related question from michael rosen who's a consultant with the clean coalition is when the recam goes into island mode will pg and e gain control of all the der including front of meter solar behind the meter solar and front of meter energy storage yeah so when we go into island mode um pg e has responsibility but there really is no control of those assets um it, it's all automated so when we go into island mode and the recloser opens um, and, and whether it's a, seam, a seamless transition or, or a break before make transition, the battery system will, Tesla's battery system will form the microgrid and it will then meet the, exactly meet the load. Obviously the, the generation needs to meet the load. Otherwise you have problems in terms of voltage and, voltage and frequency, um, you know, deviations and, and things go, things, things go south very quickly. So, the, the generation is going to exactly meet the load. There's no controlling how much generation we're producing. Um, if the if the, uh, the 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 DC um, the DC uh, coupled solar plus battery system will be managed such that if there's too much PV power from that, it will just be curtailed by the control system. And, um, and, and, you know, in order to made, manage the battery state of charge, we obviously don't, don't want to overcharge the battery. As I mentioned a minute ago, if there's not enough and the battery state of charge goes too low, eventually we would just shut down. In terms of the in front of the meter, I'm sorry, the behind the meter system, the NEM system, that is just a standard net metered system. There is a, um, there is a, uh, a SCADA control breaker on that system. And because we could have a situation if the battery was fully charged, and the loads were rather low, and it was a full solar day. As I said, the peak load on that system, uh, on that circuit, is about 330. So if it was, if the load was kind of low, let's say it's 250, and the PV system's producing 300, and the battery's full, that's a problem. And so we will have the ability to um, to curtail that system if needed. But that would only be in the case where you know there's too much generation on that circuit, and you've got to curtail something in order to you know otherwise otherwise everything's going to shut down. So um, other than that. PG&E is not controlling those generators. Um, they are just there to serve the, the, the islanded load. Great, and another question about how this all works. Um, Dave Freibush at Peninsula Clean Energy also asks, what is the communications link between the resource and PG&E for control in the event of a grid outage? Is it connected to PG&E Derm's system? Ah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, it, I, I think initially it will not be connected to PG&E's DERM system, but I think, you know, um, looking to the future, um, I mean, I can't speak for PG&E, but I think, you know, it, it's, it's certainly on their radar screen and I think on everybody's radar screen that eventually when we have a lot of DERs on, on, the, on the distribution system, we want them integrated into people's DERM systems and we want things as automated as they can be eventually. Hopefully, I mean, if we're at 100% renewables and we're at a lot of distributed resources, there needs to be a lot of, of um, you know, communication and, and control, and it needs to be all well integrated. Initially, that that will not be the case for the germ system, but it, so there is a connection between the microgrid and PG&E's um, distribution control center. So they will be able to see the microgrid from their distribution control center, and they will be able to control things such as breakers or or the, their controller. Um, and so you know yes that it is being integrated into their system and, and this is the first time they're doing this sort of thing um so again we're, we're kind of headed toward you know better visibility and better control where needed uh but their again their control of the system is either in, in in grid connected mode they're not controlling anything again unless there was a um you know if there's a, if there's a if there's a safety issue or things are way out of whack I mean, we have we have protection relays that would that would disconnect our disconnected generator if that were the case, uh, and that's the case for any you know any interconnection with any DER. Um, and again, if we're in islanded mode, 
then the generation has to meet the load and, uh, and it has to meet it exactly. So we might, you know, something might be curtailed if, if we're necessary, but again, that's just for safety and, and quality reasons. So, um, yeah. Great. We have a few questions about vendors. Uh, Lane Sharman, Executive Director at San Diego Energy District asks, who are the vendors for the PG&E controller and the RCEA controller? Yeah, so the, the vendor for basically the, all of the controls um, is Schweitzer Engineering. And we, um, Schweitzer, both, both Tesla and Schweitzer and, and PG&E were all, were all partners um, on this project from, from early on. Um, I will say that, you know, in terms of, and I mentioned this during the, the presentation, that, you know, one key piece here was to make sure that whatever we designed and installed for this system, had to seamlessly seamlessly integrate with PG&E's infrastructure, their their hardware, their software. Um, you know, it has to be integrated into how they manage things. And again, if these are going to be, there's going to be more and more of these types of, of front of the meter multi customer microgrids with third party participation. Um, that's going to need to be something that's that's you know that's replicable and standardized. Um, so there are some you know some of the some of the communication equipment. Um, routers and, and 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 this is not my area of expertise so but you know basically uh in terms of dealing with communications um we did make some changes with specific equipment so that it would be compatible with pg e system or fit seamlessly into their system but for the most part that that was only in a few different uh, a few very special cases in terms of kind of communicate telecom equipment equipment um basically all of the control equipment is um, is through Schweitzer, en Schweitzer Engineering. And well related, uh, Ronnie Lipschutz, the co-director of Sustainable Systems Research Foundation asked why Tesla and is wondering if that was a cost effective vendor choice. Well, uh, so, uh, I, so there's a couple of reasons why Tesla. Um, one is that we have uh, prior experience working with Tesla, and we've had we've had good prior experience. Um, so the, the Blue Lake, Blue Lake uh, Rancheria Community Microgrid, which is the first microgrid project that we did, uh, was a Tesla battery system. And that in that situation, they did not do the PV. We had Rex Solar do the PV system, and and we were the, the again the, the the system integrator and worked with those vendors. Um, and that all was very successful, and and we gained a lot of knowledge about the Tesla system. They you know we developed a good working relationship. Um, so in part, we were building on that, but we did not, make, this was not a sole source. We did not make the dot decision. Um, we engaged with them early on, you know, kind of before all the decisions were made, but it was not sole source from the start. Um, so we did entertain um, other battery vendors and we, we got one other battery quote. Tesla's, Tesla's quote was more, was more cost competitive. Um, so we went for, with Tesla both for a, a, the pricing reason but also because we had prior experience working with them that um, that we could build on. Um, you know, that said, I, I, I mean, for, I think personally for us as a, as a, as an organization, um, it would be valuable for us to work with some other, some other energy storage vendors and, you know, to just to broaden our, our, our experience and our knowledge there. Um, but this project is, was, was so cutting edge in so many ways we wanted to, to to limit some of the risk of the project and therefore going with a vendor that we were uh, confident in and we had a relationship with and that had the best price uh, at least compared to the others uh, other quote that we had um, that's how we ended up with tesla and and we ended up uh you know originally just looking at tesla just for the battery system with potentially a a, a third party uh, a different vendor doing the pv system but when we got to that point of the project of, we ended up getting quotes from tesla for both just the battery system as well as a package system and the economics were in our favor to go with the package system from Tesla. So that was the decision that was made. Great, I know we're uh, well over the hour, but do you guys have a few more minutes? We have a lot of questions here. I think we could have done a two hour webinar on this. It's so interesting. Uh, and we have a few uh, financial model questions if you have a few minutes. Sure. So, I can stay on it. Hopefully, hopefully, Car hopefully Carmen can answer those. <laughs> <laughs> well, well um, sort of a, a big picture finance question is from Peter Millman. Has the business model been deemed sufficiently strong to definitely proceed? Yes. Um, that's, a question well, for that's a question for Matthew, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so I think, you know, for 
for this project, you know, this is, you know, it's, it's a real world, you know, demonstration project, but it's also, you know, um, still definitely in the R and D realm, you know, it's not something that's just, you know, um, when we looked at from a, a purely business case standpoint, we looked at it also as an opportunity for, for technology development, you know, that, that said, I think going back to, to, you know, a sort of base case scenario, um, that, that, the Carmen illustrated, you know, if if we were just, you know, paying for this entire system and this entire project, um, you know, which is which is more, you know, probably gonna be a little more expensive because there's a lot of time and planning and analysis kind of figuring out, you know, these things for the first time. Um, but you know, if if we were trying to just make it pencil out, you know, that there there frankly isn't like a you know a, a slam dunk, oh, the wholesale market values of this project, you know, are you know, pay for themselves. And so um you know, the, the the flip side of that is, you know, where those numbers land, the 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 contribution that that our CEA, you know, by our ratepayers are putting into it, you know, it, it does pencil out even when we kind of don't start diving into the the resilience values, which are obviously, you know, a little more hard to tease out than just kind of the wholesale market values. Um, you know, so, so that said, you know, the 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 Energy Commission funding. You know, is necessary at this stage, but I think one of the things we're hoping to to kind of dial in is is to streamline the process and and to help refine it. You know, and, and again, going back to, to carbon slides, you know, um, you start looking at at those resiliency values and, and starting to you know at least approximate quantification of those things. Um, you know, you 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 start to actually see a, a solid business case. So you know, we were fortunate in that the you know. Because this is a, a you know, sort of a first of its kind R&D project, there was CEC support to sort of bridge that gap. So you know, so our our RCEA rate payers aren't having to you know, substantively um, you know sub subsidize this project to learn these lessons. Um, but um, you know, e even if we were, you know, this the, the airport and the Coast Guard um, are kind of no-brainer facilities. So if there was any location that we would be you know, contributing ratepayer funds to add resiliency, this would be it. And so, you know, that's that's why we selected this site for this project. But, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it, we're fortunate to have the, the Energy Commission's support to, to make this first go at it uh, viable. But I think, you know, finding the right locations and the right opportunities and reducing costs, I think can get it to that business case. Sure. Yeah, and and Matthew, I guess I would layer on too. I mean, I think that's the fundamental of the base case project um, and the contribution of the CEC. But when you start looking at a planning horizon for, you know, the vulnerabilities for natural disasters, and particularly in a rural area like Humboldt, and those values, those values are significant. And I think one of the things too is as we go forward and start to look at this, okay, where are the costs going to come down from some of the standardization that has come through this this project? Um, the the idea of the um, offsetting the islanding premium uh, look through the uh, um, PG&E Community Microgrid Enablement Program, and that really yeah, then getting to the point of what would be the the sort of subsidy or additional um, resiliency value that people you know whether it be a CCA, uh, local government. Um, or a business would want to pay to achieve sort of those overarching, less easily quantifiable resiliency benefits. So, um, so a resounding, I guess, yes, from the perspective of what we think this project can contribute to to the thinking going forward, but also for this local community. Great. Right, yeah, and we know yeah. resilience is a huge uh, benefit. Um, what about some of the other? values some uh, wayne bader asked it would be interesting to see all the financial components that you're stacking to achieve the financial goals for example will the system provide resource adequacy to a utility partner i i think i did see something in there about all right can you speak to that yes so um we have basically you know since we're not in in market yet or constructed constructed we did a, a forward-looking forecast of what are the current markets that this um um this project could um, contribute into the market. So we are looking at um, energy only right now as part of the interconnection agreement, um, but forward looking, looking at how the RA market is going to evolve and, and where this project may be able to contribute. There are limitations as, as 
uh, as to how the project is interconnected as to what it can participate in the wholesale market. So right now, that's a forward-looking estimate of where we think that uh, this project will be able to get the revenues over its project lifetime. Um, again, we're happy to have the follow-up conversations, and that was what we were looking forward to as far as this presentation, to actually dig into some of those assumptions uh, with uh, the microgrid community uh, to further refine you know, our, our uh, results from this project and what we think is a, a reasonable replication um, uh, scenarios. So uh, we have looked at all possibilities and done a variety of forecasting. And Jim, I don't believe you mentioned it too, but we did have the benefit of the reopt modeling uh, from uh, NREL as a sort of side right. um, benefit of this and to be able to kind of triangulate around our forecast for wholesale participation. Great, well, so yeah, uh, it, uh, go ahead. I just go wanted ahead. to add, I, 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 sorry, I just wanted to add one thing briefly and, 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 and Carmen, I think sort of mentioned this um, during her presentation, but you know, the, the, the business model that we envisioned at the start of this project was a situation where you have a CCA in, in particular in, in California now because of the because of the of the ability of CCAs to do these types of projects and, and and DER projects. So you have a CCA like RCA that wants to develop local renewables, and there are many reasons to do that, and 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 they don't all pencil out the same way. But there are benefits to your local community by creating jobs, by having people put value on just having more local control over their energy. Or um, you know by by having um, you know local uh, adding resilience and, and and that sort of thing. So um, if if CCAs are looking at doing DERs in their in their uh, in their in their territories, which they are, and if they are looking at doing storage projects for similar reasons, which they are, and 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 it's really I think when you add the storage in, it adds a substantial cost. But um, if you are a CCA and you're looking at DER uh, renewable and storage projects in your community for, for many reasons, then you can say, well, wait a minute, how much more is it going to cost me um, incrementally to site, you know, you have to have the, the proper situation, but to site the, the, the renewables and the storage close to critical facilities, and then ha you have an incremental cost of providing the ability to island. So that might be a control system, it might be some, you know, some additional protection, it may be, you know, dealing with the interconnection aspects, um, but once you know PG&E has a program, or utilities in California have a program, um, you know, uh, allowing this and 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 incentivizing these even this kind of resilience for communities, um, then you know the added cost there is is not that much. And I think the business model, when you look at the incremental cost of of that those islanding features, the business model starts to look a lot more, um, you know, a lot a lot better. You know. That part of what happens with the business model, the business case that we're giving is that the solar resource in Humboldt County is is about as poor as it gets in, in California anyway. Um, and it's still it's still, you know, solar still pencils out here, but it doesn't pencil out the way it does in, in other sunnier parts of the state. So um, if, if solar and storage pencil out for you, then I think the incremental cost of the microgrid is not, is, it, you know, it, it is there's a much better chance for it penciling out. It's more challenging if you're if you're trying to you know show that all the economics of investing in those DERs from from the get go uh, is is economical. That's a little more challenging, but can pencil out I think as well in the right situation. Great. Uh, we've had a couple of questions asking if you would be able to share the detailed economic analysis, including details for costs and benefits, on slide 16. Is that something you'd be able to follow up with? Um, I think we'll be doing that right now. The the modeling that we're doing is not um, ready to be shared, but I think we'll be able to do that uh, through the stakeholder uh, engagement um, work that we're that we're kicking off shortly here. So if folks are interested in digging into that, by all means, contact me uh, or Jim uh, to sort of uh, discuss getting involved, and we can go through that in more detail in, in with that process. Great, thank you. Uh, and I just want to say this has been an excellent presentation. We've gotten a lot of great feedback, including from Tam Hunt, who says that this is very helpful for parties advocacy at the CPC and other forums. So thanks for this work. Thanks for the presentation. We're at 1220, so I think that 
we should wrap up at this point, but um, uh, we had lots of other questions, so we will be getting those uh, to the presenters and they will follow up as appropriate. And I just want to um, also mention, um, let me just switch to myself, um, that we have a lot of other great upcoming events at the Clean Coalition. You can go to our site and go to events, upcoming events. I especially want to call one out that our executive director, Craig Lewis, will be presenting at on the value of resilience of solar microgrids. That's coming up in November, and there's a number of others as well, but since we've talked a lot about the resilience value, we have a great model for actually putting a value on resilience. Um, but lots more events happening this fall. Thank you to everyone. Thanks to our amazing presenters. We could have easily talked about this for a few hours, so I really want to thank you all for sticking with us for a little longer, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your great questions, but there will certainly be some follow-up and we will send you all the recording and slides. So thanks to everyone and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rosanna. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.